I am genuinely thrilled to be here and supporting the wonderful institution of Tattered Cover Books, which gives so much support to authors from all around the world, and it's absolutely delightful to be here for a second time. Um, but I do have to be candid with you, this is the end of a book tour for me, so I am somewhat exhausted. So I may invent an entirely new language tonight. I'm not really sure how coordinated my uh, eye to speaking relationship is at the moment. And uh, I'm actually so tired that I, I reached for one of my herbal hippie chill pills in my little pill case, and I almost came this close to taking an Ambien, <laughs> which would have made for a quite mellow reading. So thankfully, I got the, uh, the right supplement uh, at the right time. So I will at least, at the very least, I can promise you that I will stay awake. Um, so yes, this is from I Love a Man in Uniform. It's about my marriage to my husband, an Army military intelligence officer. And we'll start off where courtship leads to marriage. A couple of months after moving in together, we started talking about marriage. I had fantasized about a traditional military wedding, my beloved in his finest uniform festooned with rows of miniature medals, a white dress for me and things old, new, borrowed, and blue. We'd leave the chapel by walking under an arch of sabers held high by fellow soldiers, and I, as I passed the last one, he would tap my rear with his sword per custom, saying, welcome to the army, ma'am. But our betrothal landed far afield of tradition. His proposal predicated not so much on will you, but what if. The jungle drums of war were beating, and he sensed a deployment was imminent. We had to ask, act fast. We discussed the situation. You know that if there's a war in Iraq, I'm going, right? He asked me. I nodded, and his tone turned solemn. You know what might happen when I go? So we made an appointment to go to Baltimore City Hall to say I do, just in case. I didn't have time to stage an emergence as Mrs. Army Fashionista, so on November 18th, the big day, I pieced together an ensemble befitting a closed conscious post-punk war bride. Head to toe black, knit pullover, pencil skirt, wide mesh fishnets, round-toed sling backs buffed to military grade polish. I grabbed my vintage leopard print trench coat to cover up in the November chill, and we were off to City Hall. I didn't pass under an arch of sabers like a traditional military bride, but I did have to go through a metal detector. The security guard exhibited the heart of a true romantic. Upon hearing that we were there to get married, he stage whispered to Mike, the emergency exit is that away." <laughs> on the way up to the chapel in the elevator, I realized that I wasn't a war bride. I was a war on terror bride. I appreciated the image it suggested, like I was a gore and blood drizzling matrimonial zombie freak. If it came down to a B-movie cat fight, War on Terror Bride versus Bridezilla, I would win. I wasn't weighted down by 10 pounds of lace-trimmed fluff, and with Uncle Sugar breathing down my neck, I was in a hurry. I was motivated. Our only wedding attendants were eight men in orange prison jumpsuits being led down the corridor with their ankles and wrists chained together. Mike and I had met in a graveyard, and now we were here, here we were getting hitched in immediate proximity to prisoners in handcuffs. Someone at the Department of Obvious Symbolism was working overtime on our behalf. We found the little chapel on the fourth floor. Mike put his hand on the doorknob. You ready? I held up our marriage license. Ready. He opened the door, and we looked around the vacant room. It was so, so sorry. Worse than anything you'd see on a Vegas bender. Even the cheesiest Elvis impersonator would have taken one look at the Home Depot PVC lattice arch over the altar and said, no thanks, I can't bring you kids into this mess. <laughs> I was glad our parents weren't there to see it. My mom would have wept at the urns of faux fruit on pedestals, all white plaster gilded with a misting of gold spray paint. The swags of tool that marked off the aisle, which dead-ended at a foldable partition wall behind four rows of chairs, were graying under a thick coat of dust. It was what it was, a fluorescent-lit conference room modified by the lowest bidder. We crossed the threshold. Our heels sank into the maroon carpet. Mike and I sat on the white folding chairs and held hands while we waited for the efficient to show up. My palms started to sweat. 
I knew that marrying a soldier meant marrying the military as well. I'd have the government as sort of a hectoring, ever-present mother-in-law. And if a conflict in Iraq did happen, the sphere of influence within our marriage would broaden further still. If the army was to be an intractable third party in our union, the war would be a fourth. It started to feel awfully crowded in that empty chapel. I had the nervousness of a new bride, excited butterflies, but with an added overlay of fear. What would the future be like for us when this war really got here? Could I give him what he needed? Did we really know each other well enough to make this work? I had almost gotten this far with someone else and backed out. Was I really army spouse material? Statistically speaking, yes, the ar average army spouse is under 35, 95% of spouses are female, and the majority of wives work. But was I really up to the task? The justice of the peace came into the room and we stood. I swallowed my fear and we stepped up to the cheapo garden store wedding arch. We exchanged our vows under the banks of buzzing fluorescent lights. We signed our marriage certificate and added our names to the city registry, and with a kiss, it was official. In sickness and in health, in war and in peace, we were wed. In a quick, nondescript ceremony, my life began a radical shift, not just from singleton to wife, but from free-flying civilian chick to trailing spouse, the household member who packs up house and goes along wherever the army sends the soldier. The day I really became an army wife carried the mark of bureaucratic flourish when I received my military ID, otherwise known as my DEERS card, Defense Enrollment Eligibility Reporting System card. With our marriage certificate in hand, Mike and I went to the issuing office at Fort Meade where the clerk greeted us warmly. Mike said, she's here for her dependent ID. The clerk shook her head and mouth, no. I'm sorry, I said to her, what? We don't call spouses dependents anymore. Susie Campfaller, stereotype be damned, military spouses had sufficiently cast off their dependent label. I passed her the necessary paperwork, my social security card, my passport, Mike's military ID, and our marriage certificate. From there, my information will be processed and reduced to a digitized code on the back of the card that could only be read by a scanner, a detail that felt at once impressively advanced and vaguely Orwellian. Yes, dear. Yes, dears. In no time at all, the clerk had entered my vital data and the card was almost ready to print. She pointed a small webcam my way. Okay, straight into the camera and on the count of three, smile. While we waited for the card to print, she said, don't lose this, you need it for everything, to get on post, to shop at the commissary, the PX, the liquor store, and to get your medical. I may not be dependent on my husband, but apparently I was very much dependent on this card. My card started chugging out of the printer. This was going 100 times faster than any trip I'd ever taken to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Random as it seemed, I was suddenly reminded of the time I'd posed for Playboy. When I'd recalled for the experience for Mike, he was shocked at how time and labor intensive creating a pinup could be. Who knew that getting into the army system and getting into Playboy had anything in common? But both involved lots of sitting and waiting while the experts bustled around me trying to fit me within an existing template. In 1995, Playboy issued a casting call for a layout called Women of the Internet. Because at the time, the internet was still something of a novelty. And Playboy does love the novelty shoot. Women of Mensa, women of Hooters, women of Enron, <laughs> women of Olive Garden. I hosted a couple of private online conferences in a nerdy Bay Area internet community, which seemed like a good enough qualification, so I sent in my photo and didn't hold out much hope. But a couple of months later, I got a call from an assistant photo editor named Stephanie Barnett. She said, we'd like to shoot you, and offered, me to fly out, offered to fly me out to Los Angeles later that month. The good citizens of Bunnyland do not mess around. They sent someone to LAX, to take me to my hotel by the beach and gave me a list of preparations for the shoot. Show up shaved, moisturized with your manicure and pedicure done, your hair clean, and your face free of makeup. <laughs> the following morning, a car picked me up at 9 o'clock and took me to Playboy Studio West, where I was shown the set they built for me, a makeshift stage with a tinsel curtain, a stripper pole, and a bank of video monitors. Typecast again. <laughs> <laughs> 